X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So let's welcome the speaker. Uh, yes, thank you very much for uh, my many thanks to the organizers for the kind invitation to uh, uh, participate in this conference and present some of the results we have uh, from our laboratory um, uh, in Tromsø. For those of you that uh, perhaps know me from before, I'm, my primary affiliation has been the University of Tromsø, the Arctic University of Norway, but I'm also now gradually uh, shifting to uh, a new institution, the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment, but I will have a dual appointment at, at these two places. And the focus of my talk today will be on uh, relativistic four-component linear damped response time-dependent DFT for um, valence and X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And just to give you a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to present, I'm going to talk, uh, uh, for those who are not too familiar with the effects of relativity, I'll, I'll briefly introduce um, what, what um, the main concepts are and what the consequences are for chemistry. Um, they will be particularly essential for uh, one of the applications I will discuss uh, in this talk. I will briefly, but not go into any of the details of the, uh, the work we've been doing in recent years in developing a four component uh, density functional theory using what is called restricted magnetic balance basis sets, and in particular the work towards uh, calculating uh, molecular response properties and, and um, of various kinds, uh, with a particular focus in this talk on the applications uh, using what is called damped linear response theory. So I'll briefly introduce what is the main concept of that and why, why this is uh, of interest. And then uh, the main focus of the talk will be on, on uh, the application of these methods to uh, first discuss a little bit on UV-VIS and circular dichroism spectroscopy of, of um, uh, some more exemplary uh, systems as well as, as also um, systems where they do ex uh, exist experiments. And the main bulk of the applications will focus on um, uh, the application to X-ray absorption spectroscopy of, of, of uh, complexes of uh, real experimental uh, interest. And then finally, I give some concluding remarks um, to these talks. But just to, to um, uh, set the stage, um, um, the focus on this talk will be on relativistic effects and, and the treatment of this. And that basically means we will focus on systems where um, in one way or another, the speed of the particles um, uh, involved approach the speed of light. And it's such that, for instance, the non-relativistic uh, speed of an electron, uh, a oneness electron in a, in a hydrogen-like system, that is, that is basically the nuclear charge, which basically means that when you reach a system such as gold, uh, the, the speed of the, uh, the, the oneness electron or the gold uh, atom will be uh, approximately 60% of the speed of light. So we need to take these relativistic effects into account. And that basically means that the, um, we introduce this uh, Lorentz factor that tells us uh, um, uh, the, the, this magnitude of, of this uh, uh, relativistic effects. And that is what is illustrated here, uh, basically on this, uh, how it grows with the nuclear charge of the system. Uh, of the core one is orbital and you can see that uh, as we as we approach uh, nuclear charges of around 100 the Lorentz factor will be about 1.3 and again you can see again in the speed of the, the electron that that we are approaching half uh, or passing uh, half the speed of the the um, speed of light the consequences of this is um, twofold one is for the electrons closest to the nuclei because the mass of the electron can be considered to, to, uh, to, to increase, they will contract. So the S and P orbitals will in, in, in general contract. And that is what you, for instance, and uh, see here when you look at the uh, copper, silver and gold series. And you also see that the, the effect of contraction for the, uh, the, the uh, outermost S orbital is the largest for, um, um, for the um, gold, silver and copper. Um, and as the S and P orbitals then contract, that also means that the, they screen better the nuclear charge. So D and F orbitals in general will expand. And that is for instance, the origin of the color of gold in that we have a destabilization of the five D orbitals in the, in the gold atom uh, and a stabilization of the six uh, S atoms. So whereas in non-relativistic framework, the, the color of gold would basically be the same as color of silver, so colorless. In the relativistic picture, um, gold has the, the color that we're also very familiar with. So of course, uh, and, and that is perhaps also important to emphasize that basically our world is relativistic, although we have a tendency to, to often take the non-relativistic uh, framework as a starting point because it's easier for us to do. 
Um, so the contraction of core orbitals and the, the, uh, the expansion of valence orbitals is one characteristic part uh, of relativistic effect. The other effect is what is called the spin orbit effects, which basically means that orbitals such as the P orbitals, or in this case shown here, the D orbitals that are in the non-relativistic uh, picture for an atomic system, they are all five-fold degenerate. They will split into uh, different sets of uh, orbitals in this particular d3 half and d d5 half orbitals. And this spin orbit splitting uh, is then also very decisive in many cases. You can see it here also in the case of gold. But when we start discussing X-ray spectroscopy, it really becomes of essence when we, we look at excitations out of either p orbitals or uh, d orbitals. Um, because basically we'll have two kinds of excitations, either out of the P1 half or P3 half, or out of the D3 half or D5 half. So it's not, uh, as you perhaps intuitively, or, or in a non relativistic picture, you would expect one absorption band or uh, uh, one orbital set of orbitals you excite out of, you now have two different sets of orbitals, and we'll return to that a little bit later. So these are the main effects that we, we, uh, we see in the daily, uh, in, in that, and that affects the chemistry. Uh, contraction of SMP orbitals, expansion of the uh, DNF orbitals, and spin orbit effects. Um, from a mathematical point of view, the, 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 the other change is that we now go from what is, uh, if you look at consider only a one electron system, we go from the traditional Schrodinger equation that we are all well, very well familiar with into the Dirac equation, which is given here on the right here for the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the free particle. And another change that then happens when we move from this non-relativistic to relativistic picture is that we no longer have a, a, a wave function or a, we do have a wave function, but it's now has four different components. So it becomes a four, a four component uh, quantity uh, vector function. And it's also complex because in the, inherent in the quantities appearing here um, um, in the alpha operators, the, 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 the Dirac um, op, uh, operators, we we now also have complex quantities. So in principle, we just look at this, the fact that we now go from uh, one to four components uh, and the fact that we also have complex uh, arithmetic. And in principle, you would be perhaps guided to think that the computational complexity of going into this full four component uh, picture should be approximately a factor of a hundred. In practice, um, and that is important for me to emphasize, uh, you can get this down to a factor of about 10 doing full four component uh, uh, calculations through various techniques for, for speeding up the calculations. I should also here add that by using techniques to take away the small components, which describe the positronic solutions of the equations and only focus on the large component. There are various schemes to do that and I'm not going to discuss them in this talk. Uh, you can basically get the computational cost down to a factor of two compared to a non-relativistic calculation. So what I'm basically saying is we're coming to a point where doing full relativistic calculations is not uh, any significantly more expensive than doing a non-relativistic calculation. And in many cases, relativistic effects can be significant. So it's something that should be included in our calculations. What are the consequences? Well, I already mentioned silver and gold. Uh, there's also been great work by Peter Schweidfeger to, uh, to uh, illustrate that mercury, the fact that mercury is a liquid at, at, uh, at room temperature, is a due to relativistic effects. Uh, Pekka Pika, uh, a few years ago, uh, very elegantly demonstrated that the fact that the uh, car battery works is again a consequence of relativistic effects. And I come from the northern parts of Norway, where the sun has now stopped uh, rising above the horizon. And some of the elements in the northern light is also a, a consequence of, of, um, of relativistic effects. But there are, I should say, there are other effects that dominate the northern lights. But this is also an encouragement for you to come and visit us in Tromsø at some point and, and experience this. You have to come in winter, but uh, in order to have the, uh, have the darkness, but it, it's, a, it's a unique, unique experience. Um, but I'm going to focus on spectroscopy. And of course, this is the focus of, to a large extent, this, this meeting. So I don't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this figure, just saying that all depending on what kind of uh, frequency of the electromagnetic right we're using, we can probe different parts of the electronic structure or the nuclear structure of the molecule, as we heard also in the previous talk. I will focus 
particularly on the UVVs and the X-ray regions. So I'll be looking largely on electronic excitations within the molecules, either then from valence orbitals in the UVVs or from uh, core orbitals in the X-ray um, uh, region. Uh, if we consider what happens when we apply an, an electromagnetic field on a molecular system, so we have uh, an oscillating electromagnetic field oscillating with a, with a given frequency, what will happen is that we gradually induce a dipole moment in the molecule that will oscillate with the frequency of the incoming light um, in, within the mo molecule itself. What you're basically seeing then is that you have a gradual population, uh, and in particular, if you are in in resonance with an excitation energy will have a complete inversion of the population uh, from the ground state where you start into the excited state of the molecule and then you will have stimulated the mission again down to the ground state and so on so 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 this is basically what what happens when um when you apply an electromagnetic field and change the electronic structure and that through these variations we can get information about how um uh, the electron density response to the external field. And that again can tell us by combining theory and experiment uh, information about uh, the electron density of a given system. And of course, this is doing it all in the real time uh, domain where we then propagate the electron density uh, in the presence of this time dependent electric field. But we can do a Fourier transform. So this is basically what the induced type of moment we would have uh, in the, this is uh, this particular case is the SF6 molecule. Uh, but we can do a Fourier transform and get out in this particular case an X-ray spectrum for this, this molecule. So using real-time methods, we can Sorry to interrupt. I mean, can you hear? Professor? I can't hear. Okay. Uh, can I? Uh, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, coming back. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. So, uh, okay. So you missed something. Oh. Uh, take your time. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, the uh, telephone here is. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. So, uh, real time. Um, allows you to propagate electron density um, um, and, uh, and through Fourier transform, we can generate the spectrum of interest. Um, and uh, what we would do computationally is then to uh, solve the time dependent Dirac equation in the case when we're doing real, uh, when you're doing uh, relativistic theory. Um, the benefit of this, it's fairly easy to implement. Uh, you just have to solve this equation and you have to propagate it in time. The challenge is that you have to do a lot of time steps. Uh, so, uh, and it's also quite sensitive to the, uh, the, the time step you, you, you do in your calculations. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a time consuming approach, but, but it also allows you to treat really strong uh, fields. Um, so what I will focus on in this talk is rather what we call this damped response theory. Um, this is basically uh, time dependent perturbation theory, but where we introduce a finite lifetime for the excited state. Because normally when you do a time dependent perturbation theory approach or a response theory uh, approach, you would get a stick spectrum. So you get excitations only at the, at the, at the, at the excitation energies of the, of the system. But by introducing a finite lifetime for the excited states, we're able to also get uh, a kind of a line shape uh, reflecting the lifetime of these um, excited states. Um, and of course, the final way of, of, of getting an experimental spectrum is using just the um, solve, uh, solving the TDD FTF equations and getting the excitation ends directly, and the, the uh, residues gives us then the transition moments. Uh, and we have implemented all of these kinds of methods now in the um, four component relativistic program that we are developing in Bratislava and in Tromsø called uh, RESPECT. So um, if you're interested in these kinds of methods, I would, I would uh, encourage you to, to have a look at this program. So what is the basic, sorry, basic principles of the damped response theory? Basically we do a expansion, perturbation expansion of the time uh, dependent electron density in orders of the applied perturbation, and that then could be uh, the applied electric, uh, uh, electric field. Uh, and we determine the, these um, 
perturbed uh, electron densities through uh, these parameters here, X uh, and Y, that we determine from, well, I guess, what many of you would uh, they refer to as the CEDA equations. I would refer to these as the linear response, or it's basically also the time dependent, part, uh, time dependent perturbation theory expression for an uh, SCF like uh, wave function. And the, the key point in terms of the damped uh, response is this gamma factor here, the imaginary gamma factor that, that gives us the, uh, that is a phenomenological parameter for us, and that, that tells us uh, or that provides us uh, is our way of providing the lifetime. Of, uh, of the calculation. Um, the benefit also, I should add, of, of using this damped response theory is we can also calculate uh, scattering properties like polarizabilities and go through poles. So go through the points where the, um, the response function would diverge due to the fact that we hit the resonance. Um, so that allows us to do a full frequency spectrum of the polarizability, for instance. Omega here is the excitation energy of interest, and we determine this by finding the poles of our response function. Now, why is this important? So, one, one uh, and it's interesting to do it like this. One very important reason is that if you try to determine the eigenvalues, most algorithms would do this from the bottom up. So, you basically would start with the lowest eigenvalues and, and climb your way up in, into higher eigenvalues. And when you're going into X ray regions, and I'm going to show you uh, excitations up in the 10,000 electron volts that's a rather unsurmountable task. So by selecting the frequency you're interested in, so by selecting omega to be the region you're interested in, you're able to target specifically the region of interest. So instead of having to find all excited states up to 10,000 uh, electron volts, we can target that area because we know that's where experiment uh, is, uh, uh, the, the experimental data we're looking for it, it can be found. Um, we have also implemented this in such a way that we can calculate multiple frequencies. We can calculate up to 100 omega, so 100 uh, frequencies uh, of the incoming light uh, simultaneously. So um, the cost of doing all these different frequencies is uh, not an issue. Um, what you can question both with the real-time approach and the damped response theory approach is whether or not you're able to do an analysis because we get directly the um, uh, densities. Um, but what we are able to do uh, is to select, for instance, the orbital we excite out of. So, uh, so basically, we can select which orbit I occupied orbital we excite out of and only include the transition dipole moment from these orbitals. This has uh, the benefit of getting very clean spectra. We can analyze uh, which orbitals contribute, both uh, occupied and virtual, to the given transition that we see. But an equally important region, uh, reason for doing this is once you are up in frequency uh, energy ranges of a few hundred EVs, um, because we use finite basis sets, you will also have artifacts in your calculations. Um, that, so you see transitions that are non-physical. Uh, which are due to the fact that you have finer basis sets in your calculations. And figuring out which of these transitions or which of the bands you see that are physical and true and which are uh, due to these artifacts is difficult by itself. But by selecting where you excite out of, you can be sure that the bands that you see, they correspond to the, the, the true excitations you're, you're uh, interested in. So that's basically um, what I'm going to uh, talk to you about in terms of the methodology and the, the general concepts of relativity and, and um, absorption spectroscopy. Uh, and I'm going to spend the last um, um, five or 10 minutes or so to, to, to show you a couple of examples uh, that we've been recently been doing. And first, I'll uh, apply this to absorption circular dichroism, circular dichroism that is a differential absorption of right and left circular polarized light. Um, and that uh, exists. Uh, in the natural case for chiral molecules. So it's a way of determining the stereochemistry of molecules. So uh, just to show you a little bit of the effects of uh, relativity here. So this is the C4HX8X8H8X uh, X series, where X now is oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, polonium, and livermorium. And I'll show you only the four lowest members here. And the things to note, first of all, is that there is no difference between doing real time and uh, this damped response theory. The curves completely overlap. You can also see that basically down to tellurium, uh, there is no significant differences between one, uh, one component and four component uh, spectra. You can see there are some differences here at around 10 dB for the absorption spectrum. But as you go down into heavier members of the series, 
uh, the effects of relativity becomes quite uh, significant. And if I'm going to point out perhaps one interesting uh, point here, when you uh, focus on circular dichroism, uh, a key point is that you would like to, um, the two enantiomers of a molecule uh, will have spectra that are each other's mirror images. So the fact that you have a wrong sign potentially uh, between absorption bands that would could lead you uh, to misassign the stereochemistry of that molecule. So if you look here at polonium, you will see that the lowest energy bands up to 6 eV, they basically have opposite sign at the four component and one component theory. So this is a case where not including relativistic effects would potentially make you misassign the stereochemistry of this uh, particular molecule. Now this of course, a rather esoteric molecule, but again, it's a proof of principle that relativity should be included once you start going into the um, uh, uh, systems with um, uh, heavy elements. Um, um, just to show some more perhaps uh, relevant systems, these are um, um, some uh, metal organic complexes uh, with three phenyl groups. So it's a fairly large system. They're all done. This, these calculations have been done uh, at the um, uh, to two component level of theory, X to C, with uh, also using resolution of the identity. And again, you can see there is significant differences, uh, also in this case for, um, for uh, the iron complex between relativistic and non-relativistic uh, uh, um, uh, methodologies. So in this particular case, uh, even for lower energy, um, even for uh, less heavy elements, uh, inclusion of um, uh, relativistic effects is mandatory. And why is this? This is because, uh, whereas in the previous system I showed you, we largely have what we call scalar relativistic effects. When you come into iron, ruthenium, osmium, we also have the spin orbit uh, effects. We start seeing splitting of the d orbitals uh, that uh, are either we excite out of or we excite into. Um, and just to show, if you now focus on the, uh, uh, the osmium complex here, and we have two bands in particular I will, I will highlight. I, I will highlight this one here at the, the negative band at the four component level at around 2.6. Um, and the one at 4.5. Um, um, and just show you that through this, we can show uh, that for the 2.6 uh, band, we're largely exciting out of osmium D orbital into the phenyl pi orbitals. So this is a metal to ligand charge transfer excitations. And we can get this out of, uh, by analyzing the, the uh, perturbed density that we get out of our calculations. You can also see that there are some differences in terms of which orbitals contribute to the absorption and the CD spectra. This is another general uh, feature that you may um, uh, enhance certain excited states in CD spectra that perhaps are uh, not so prominent in the absorption spectra. So the two spectroscopies are also complementary. Now to the main bulk of, um, of the talk, L23 and M45 edges, that basically means I'm going to look at excitations either out of the 2P orbital uh, or, or out of P orbitals, the L edges, or out of the uh, um, uh, D orbitals from the M edges of uh, a set of transition metal complexes. And before doing so, I want to, uh, we have done a lot of benchmarking to see what is needed. What is commonly done when you do these kinds of calculations is that you, you know that you have certain errors in your DFT functional arising due to, for instance, self-interaction errors, the fact that you perhaps haven't fully included all relativistic effects. So you normally shift your absorption edge to match the start onset of absorption edges in, in, uh, in, uh, in experiments. Uh, and what I will show you is that using full four component relativistic theory, that kind of shift and a proper selection of functionals, uh, that kind of shift is you don't actually have to do this anymore. But first, um, let's start by looking at basis set effects. This is a, there's a lot of graphs here. The, the main message I want to give you here is that basically there isn't a significant basis set effect. Whether you use uh, valence double zeta or augmented valence double zeta, uh, the, uh, the, the differences are very minor for, um, uh, for all of these kinds of systems. But we do see um, that uh, for you, if you use augmented basis functions on the um, ligand atoms, so not the metal atoms themselves, then we do see uh, some bands that are uh, relevant for for um, for um, uh, 
uh, the spectra we will be looking at. So basically, all calculations I'm going to show you from now on, we'll use this uh, dials VDZ basis set for the heavy element, and the correlation consisted augmented VDZ basis sets for, for uh, the ligands. And all these calculations shown here is using the PBE functional. So we have the basis set in order. It's not a relevant issue. I, I should also say we have tested the geometry. It's not a significant uh, geometry effect. So also there you can use the experimental geometry or optimized geometries and so on. Uh, if you then start looking at the exchange correlation functional, you see instead now they were looking at the rhenium uh, tetraoxide complex. There is a much, much bigger dependency on the choice of functional. Um, and in particular, uh, there's a strong dependence on whether or not to use uh, 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 exact exchange or not. So this is the PBE functional, no exact exchange at all. We get a um, large shift by introducing exact heart refocal exchange. And you can see when we increase the exact heart refocal exchange to 50%, there's another significant change in the energy. And if you now look a little bit to the right here and look at the experimental spectrum, uh, it's quite clear that we should, for the rhenium tetraoxide, uh, probably use uh, a higher than 20% uh, exact heart refocal exchange and closer to, to 50%. 50, uh, 50%. Um, before I proceed and do even more significant tests on, on the, uh, or more extensive tests on uh, the importance of exact heart refocal exchange, uh, I want to just emphasize that um, uh, the spin orbit splitting. So which is what we see here, the spin orbit splitting between the M4 and M5 edges, M4 and M5 edges, this uh, molybdenum tetrasulfide complex, it does not depend on the amount of uh, heart refocal exchange. So it's, it's the onset of the absorption band, not the spin orbit splitting itself. That's also then nice to know. Um, then we did a large study of, uh, of uh, many complexes. Um, I'll um, um, show uh, the more details on the structures that we've been using, including all the, the way down to uranium complexes from vanadium down to uranium. And the thing to notice here is that basically um, all the curves are linear, dependence on the exact amount of artifact exchange. And for high energy transitions, this is not so easy to see from this graph, um, then 60% hard to fork gives you a very good uh, agreement with the experimental data. If you have excitations that are below, uh, say around a thousand electron volts, then 40% uh, is a more accurate estimate. So that means if your transitions are less than thousand EV, 40% exact hard to fork, above thousand EV, 60% exact hard to fork. And whether you use P3LIP, we use PB0, is not so important either. It's the amount of exact heart refocal exchange um, that is essential here. Um, and then that, this is basically the spectrum you get. Now, in this particular case, it's a, it's a low energy transition. It's the M, uh, M, M4 5 edges in uh, mole, molybdenum tetrasulfide again. And you can see there is no shift applied here. And we basically get very good agreement with the experimental data, both for the spin orbit splitting and for the onset of the absorption peaks. Um, this is the error you basically see uh, we, ha we have. So we, we're talking about errors in the worst case of about 15 EV uh, of a transition that is uh, close to 12,000 EV. So the errors by using this is very, very small. So this uh, at the four component level, 60% to 40% exact heart refocal exchange, we can get accurate uh, results for uh, the onset of the absorption edges in these systems. Um, I'm running a little bit out of time. This is just to show that uh, I can perhaps use the next slide that uh, all depending on the kind of experiment, you have different resolution, different lifetimes you experience. We can model this also in our calculations by changing this uh, damping parameter and get very good agreement in this particular case for a uranium complex with the experimental uh, uh, data. And again, no shift has been applied in terms of the onset. So again, very good agreement with the experiment. And as a last final example, this is just to see how can we do if we test this on a real, really big system. This is all again four component calculations with a tungsten uh, as a met, uh, uh, metal center. So there's this uh, tungsten uh, tetrachloride. I can't even pronounce where, what this molecule is called, but two tungsten uh, atoms. Um, this is our calculations for uh, respectively tungsten uh, hexachloride and tungsten uh, this, this uh, tungsten complex uh, for the L3 and the L2 edge. And what's interesting to note is the difference in the fact that 
for the tungsten tetrahexachloride. It's a flat top up here, which should be compared with the F curve down here. Whereas we have a increasing edge towards higher energies, which should be compared with the D uh, graph down here. And again, we reproduce this. This changes when you move to the L2 edge. And again, this is reproduced by our calculation. So we again have fantastic agreement, both in terms of absolute energies and the shape of the absorption bands for these rather large and big uh, systems. So to conclude, what I hope you've been able to show you is that we have an approach now at the four component level theory, we can treat the relativistic systems, uh, realistic systems, and we can treat them accurately. And we can treat them also L2, 3, and M4, 5 edges, um, even for very heavy element systems. And, before closing, I would just like to thank the people who's done all the work. Lukas Konechny is a postdoc in my group, who's now gone to the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg. Um, Mika Repiski uh, is uh, working with me in Drumsa um, as a researcher there. We have had also great collaboration with Jan Wiesha in Slin.